All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Arkansas Alumni Association's Lunch and Learn series. We're really glad you're here with us. My name is Mary Kate Harrison, and I am the Executive Projects Coordinator here at the Alumni Association. Today, we have a special presentation from the U of A College of Engineering Dean John English and the Arkansas Alumni Association National Board of Directors member Richard Walter. And we'll be discussing leading when unanswered questions abound, which is definitely the case right now. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone to please keep yourselves muted throughout the presentation so that we can hear Dean English and Mr. Welcher as much as possible. There will be some time at the end for Q&A, so don't worry about that. Um, now I'd like to introduce you all to Mr. Richard Welcher. Richard is an alumni of the University of Arkansas College of Engineering. He graduated in 1999 with a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering, and then again in 2004 with his Master's in Civil Engineering. Following the completion of his undergraduate studies, Mr. Welcher began practicing structural engineering, geotechnical engineering, and construction materials testing, and obtained an original licensure as a professional engineer in 2003. He is currently responsible for overall company operations after working his way from design engineer to a principal in his firm, Tatum Smith Welcher Engineers. Richard simultaneously also is an adjunct professor with the University of Arkansas College of Engineering and the Faye Jones School of Architecture. He maintains a licensure as a professional engineer in 40 states and serves as a structural engineer of record on all projects and directs work associated with Tatum Smith Welcher's national accounts clients. He was the 2014 recipient of the University of Arkansas College of Engineering Early Career Distinguished Alumni Award, along with being a member of the Northwest Arkansas Business Journal 2015 Class of 40 Under 40 of Regional Emerging Business Leaders. He is currently chairman of the National Council of Examiners for Engineering and Surveying Civil Structural Professional Engineering Exam Development Committee. Richard has also been elected to the Arkansas Academy of Civil Engineering, and we're very fortunate to have him also serve on the National Board of Directors for the Alumni Association. So thank you for being here with us today, Richard. We appreciate it. Of course. All right, Richard, I'll let you introduce uh, Dean English here. Sure thing. So uh, we're very fortunate to have Dean John English here with the uh, College of Engineering. Um, anybody who's come into contact with Dean English knows um, how friendly and how outgoing he is and uh, uh, just does not fit the prototype of a Dean that is standoffish at all. You can reach out to him and he'll often just respond with John. Uh, so uh, from a personal standpoint, I've gotten to know him over the years. Uh, as being the student side and then the adjunct faculty side. Um, I would defer to you, Mary Kate, to, to give his bio background. I just wanted to give a, a brief personal introduction, but I mean, uh, there's not much more to say than <laughs> for Dean of a College of Engineering, you've done well. Sure, yeah, I'll give uh, Dean English a short bio here. Um, thank you, Dean English, for joining us as well. Like Richard said, he is the Dean of the College of Engineering. He's also the holder of the Irma F. and Raymond F. Giffels Endowed Chair in Engineering at the U of A. He received his BSEE degree and master's degree in operations research from the University of Arkansas and his PhD in industrial engineering and management from Oklahoma State. Let's see. He has served on the faculties of Texas A&M University, Kansas State University, and now at the University of Arkansas. He is the head of the U of A Department of Industrial, he was the head of the U of A Department of Industrial Engineering from 2000 to 2007. And prior to joining the University of Arkansas as Dean in 2013, he was the Leroy C. and Eileen A H. Passley Chair of the Kansas State College of Engineering. Dr. English is a fellow of the Institute of Industrial Engineers. He has served as editor for IIA, IIE Transactions on Quality and Reliability Engineering as a Board of Trustee member for IIE, a member of the Chair of the Board of Directors for the Reliability and Maintainability Synopsium, a juror for the NCEES Engineering Awards for Connecting Professional Practice and Education, and scores of other international positions. He has also actively published in the areas of quality, reliability, and logistics. So again, thank you, Dean English, for being here with us today, too. 
Well, thank you so much. And I thank you for those kind uh, introductions. It's always awkward sitting through the biographical sketch, you know, and it was like, oh, come on, come on. <laughs> but uh, it is really my pleasure to be here. And thank you for inviting me for doing this. And uh, I had kind of fun putting this topic together uh, because, you know, I do think this is the essence of what we've all been facing, whether it be a university or an industry or wherever you're at. I mean, heck, even at home, you know, it's tons of unanswered questions that we're facing. And and, and we certainly aren't short of them right now. Uh, in fact, we have a forum this afternoon where some 400 plus faculty and staff are going to join me and I, four other deans and the provost and basically have an open forum. So uh, lots of lots of questions. And so uh, so I thought, you know, maybe maybe that'd be fun for us to do. So, um, so you heard a little bit about me. I think I do want to make clear. In fact, I, I made sure I had my life uh, membership pin on my lapel. Um, I always make a plug for this. And, you know, I guess 20 years or so, Elizabeth and I kind of hit and miss, and we'd forget to pay our alumni association dues. And Brandy, somehow you'd always find us. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I hadn't done that in a few years. And I said, well, why don't we just do the life membership? I mean, and it was partially tax deductible, if I recall. And so I always make a plug for that because this is your connection to the University of Arkansas. And so um, I just encourage everybody to do that. I should have done it when I was 20 years old because I also so it saved a boatload of money. Uh, and, and I would always stay, retain my membership and would let it slip. Um, you heard about what I... I've done, you know, the crazy thing is, you know, I'm only 32 years old and somehow I've gotten 32 years of experience at the university and uh, not really, I'm 62, but, you know, 20 of those 32 years have been in administrative roles. And I, I, I tell you, in all these years, I have never seen anything like this and what we've, what we've gone through in the last since March the 12th of this year, uh, March the 10th, we were sitting in a meeting saying, do you think this is going to be real? And by March the 12th, we were going remote. And so Mitch Daniels, great president at Purdue University, in fact, our chancellor uh, worked for Dr. Daniels for a while, uh, made this quote back in April. And I thought it was profound and it was exactly right. Now, sadly and ironically, the very density we have consciously fostered is at the least for the moment our enemy. Distance between people, that is, less density, is now the overriding societal imperative. It could be argued that a college campus will be among the most difficult places to reopen for our previously regular activities. You know, we have never shut down a university, and we've never opened up the university. We, we've had snow days, maybe a snow week back in 13, with some horrific weather. But we have never done anything like this before. Uh, Dr. Daniels is exactly right. And, and, and I will make a plug here because one of the common comments that are coming our direction right now is, heck, I'm doing this remote. Why am I paying all this tuition? This is very hard. This is very expensive for us to do it as well as we can. And, and, I, and so I, I, I kind of want to make a plug that our costs have gone up because of this, buying equipment and training people and overcoming obstacles and just working and working and working. The university is, is designed to, though somewhat so monotonous, but is to go to class, take the lectures, have three or four tests, and then take the final, and then move on to the next semester. We are very efficient in producing college degrees. And so this is diametrically opposed to our very nature of who we are as a university. And so the questions are just, just countless. They came fast and furious. I mean, it started March the 12th. I was meeting with our senior team every day for multiple hours trying to tackle these. Uh, they've never been before in an environment we've never experienced, literally connecting to life and death concerns. Uh, which is very unusual in the university setting. As a faculty member, we feel safe and protected students. It's hollowed ground. And Virginia Tech crisis, things like that, just set off traumas uh, because we just, we just are used to peace and calmness. And um, our constituents that come to a university campus, we cover the whole gambit. Summer camps, we've down to first graders for some of our engineering camps now. And so we go from elementary school kids to senior adults. So we run the whole gambit of walking in and off campus all the time, dismantling college instruction, research disruption, 
video meetings. I had never had one until March the 12th, 13th. <laughs> and so, you know, the technology is like, oh my gosh, we had to come up sweet in home offices. You know, I, I know everyone on this call can relate, you know, and I'm going in the office a little bit now, which is kind of like, I think a vacation for my wife, getting me out of the house for a little bit. But, you know, I get off work at five or six and I open up the door and walk into the hall and say, I'm home. <laughs> I've been home all day long. And so it's just been bizarre. It goes on and on and on. So what do we learn as a leadership principle? And I think everyone is going to relate to this. Guiding principles. Because when you unleash any organization like an academic college and do something you've never done before in an environment where we're a state agency, we have policies and procedures for literally breathing, and we have nothing for this. And so this for us was a very new world. And, and so we immediately, rather than, I, I'm, not, I'm not smart enough to come up with the immediate policies and procedures to do everything, and I can't possibly get my hands around it. So the guiding principles began coming forth. And so I would deploy the department heads and associate deans do things like faculty should do nothing that will force students to get together. That was an early on principle that we followed. Faculty should do nothing that causes them to face students. You can't lead by committee anymore. We love to lead by com committees around the university. People had to start making decisions, AKA the dean and the department heads and the associate deans and managers of units had to start making decisions and recognize very quickly before we even announced everybody was going remote, anyone can go remote should they be concerned. Human safety is paramount. You know, following CDC, ADA's Chancellor Steinmetz has been absolutely committed to staying in that sandbox and, and maybe at times being a little stricter, you know, and never doing something that they wouldn't recommend. We quickly defined essential personnel and because we, there are certain things we had to keep going. And so mandatory people, and then also then someone would have to go in and do some experiments like in the research labs. And we got very specific, get in, do your job and get out. And, you know, it just goes on and on. Shutting down the building, surprising. We don't shut down buildings. This is a public organization. You know, we, we're open. And that was, that was a big decision to shut down buildings. Um, remote documenting research had to be redacted, uh, redirected. Uh, latent budget impact. You know, as any organization, when budget impact starts hitting and the threat of it, we had to manage through calmness in a very big storm because we don't want people to see us shaking. And uh, actually, there's a whole story behind that, that principle that comes from one of my mentors years ago. And then right as we were really starting to try to move into a groove to calm campus down, what a wonderful group of deans we had on campus. We put our arms together and we agreed upon some, some principles that we were going to be our guiding light that we could promise to campus. And we were going to do all we could do to ensure people's job security. Contingency cuts, we're going to use first time, one time money, meaning that we will hopefully be temporary and not reoccurring. And so we just put our arms together. We're going to be transparent. Uh, we committed to help each other out under number 19, financially, under personnel. I mean, every one of these deans I, I would hand in my desk in a second if something happened and I need somebody to cover for me. Uh, and so we, we tried to demonstrate through these guiding principles, A, the college were heading this direction, as well as the deans were committed. So we managed to get things shut down and, and then started realizing, oh my gosh, how are we going to turn this thing back on? And Chancellor Stan Steinmetz came out with a quote that I adamantly agree with, and it's very similar uh, to President Mitchell, is returning to campus will be infinitely harder than shutting down campus. And, you know, to kind of quote college students, he is so right about that. <laughs> he, he uh, oh my gosh, uh, we have a moving target and it changes almost daily. We're in fact in our third version of our college plan to return to campus. I suspect we could have three to four more versions of that before we settle down to whatever steady state's gonna be. So again, we started laying out guiding principles. Now we have a little bit of advantage experience. And so we start collecting our thoughts a little more clearly rather than guiding principles when we we're shutting down, it was just kind of boom, 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 boom. And, and now we can think through these, 
we can line them up with the chancellor's guiding principles, be congruent with the university. And so, and in fact, we, we look a little more structured now, you know, and so that's one of the advantages of having going down the shutdown, but now we're facing this turbulent turning back on with, with many, many questions. And, you know, first is the U of A is going to follow the guidance of CDC and Arkansas Department of Health. Also, number two, people return campus on an as-needed basis as slowly and safety as possible. You'll look at the campus plan. There's a phase one, two, three. It's the chancellor's desire is more of a general gradual turn on of campus. People only that have to be on campus are to come to campus. People can come in, be remote, and, and go back home or go back to campus. Just depend. We've got rotational schedules. And so we're trying to be calm and collected and a gradual warming to the 24th of August when all these wonderful students are back on campus and uh, we're under really kind of a new operation. Employees and graduate students can work remote effect effectively and efficiently. They're welcome to do so. Our plans are designed to mitigate early the risk. Um, you know, we know, unfortunately, people will get sick and God forbid somebody die but we're gonna to try to mitigate it to the best of our ability is a guiding principle of this university and our college. Uh, number five, in consultation with ADH, we'll have a protocol and we do for self-assessment. We're supposed to certify every morning and, and I don't know how everybody else is doing that. I'm missing about one or two days a week. I get, uh, go to bed, oh my gosh, I didn't certify. But we're supposed to daily certify either I'm on campus and I, I'm symptom free or I am not symptom free or it's not applicable because I'm doing my work somewhere else, AKA my little office here at the house. Um, our plans are gonna are seek to protect people at the highest risk of severe illness. Chuck Tillman, one of my past students is on this call and he knows my wife is a transplant recipient. And that today is number four on the CDC risk. A couple of weeks ago, she was number two. And so we're, we're in that, I, I can relate to high, I, I can totally empathize to high risk people. Our plans will provide for centrally managed cleaning and sanitizing supplies. We've got plans on how to clean classrooms, clean our offices, kits out to faculty and staff. All units are ready to go remote. We've done that once, so we've had one rehearsal. And so maybe we've got a number nine. We're gonna be inclusive. We're gonna eliminate any essence of differential power. We call this out constantly on my senior team. And it's never been more important for the University of Arkansas is to have zero tolerance to any type of retaliation regarding somebody's personal decision. I'm committed as dean, as a senior administrator, to eliminate power differential. And Richard, thank you for those kind comments. That gives me a kind of a feeling that maybe I'm accomplishing something because power differential is, it runs rampant in universities. They're very hierarchical. There's a faculty separation because of education and scholarship, blah, blah, blah. And that's really kind of what it is to me, blah, blah, blah. Um, and right now, we're gonna eliminate it. I'm gonna fight it with everything I'm as a dean to not have any implication of that power differential. And we also know that agility and flexibility are going to be key. So those are our guiding principles for the college and the university, the first data, the actually the university's ones, and we had a couple at the end. And uh, that's the way we're gonna go with it. Now, another thing that's kind of been debatable, if you live in Arkansas, you've seen, you see a lot of debate, but anywhere you see a debate about face coverings. And this isn't a political statement, but I know what our chancellor said. I'm gonna protect you, you're gonna protect me, and we're gonna protect each other. We're wearing face masks. And there will be a policy and specific guidelines and words granted to faculty whose students perhaps refuse to wear them and, 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 and vice versa for, for faculty and staff who refuse to wear it. We will start with an educational aspect, but could move to some punitive actions should in fact that be unfortunately necessary. I hope it won't. We, we saw the nature of the mumps uh, pandemic in the spring. And you know, for those that work for the university, we were all very compliant. I think it was practically everybody went through it and got their second shot. If they couldn't, like me, I had got the blood work done. Everybody, we worked through it and we cut off the pandemic. So we are very hopeful what we have will accomplish our guiding principle in that we will mitigate the risk of COVID-19. So what, have I, what, what, what do I, and things I have read and that have validated in me, 
Now, some, some kind of silly references here, and then some very serious references. Uh, uh, one, you'll see somebody, Enzo, if you've seen the movie, Art Racing in the Rain. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the senior golden retriever whose owner is a uh, semi-pro Ferrari driver and a big-time mechanic. And I read the book years ago. So, I mean, man, I've seen the movie, I bet, five times. And so Enzo is the golden retriever. And in fact, I have a whole presentation quoting Enzo. So a little silly, but he has some great philosophy. Jim Kaufman was a provost emeritus at Kansas State. Jim Collins, I imagine most of you are familiar with Good to Great, and then President Nixon. So what have I, what, what have I seen in my knowledge in view of validation? Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Kaufman back at K-State, vision is something you wrap yourself around. Our college has got a vision statement but we have a tagline preparing you for your tomorrow. I'm gonna to tell you, I have seen that over and over and over again this spring. That, you know, this has, been, this has been terrific what faculty and staff have pulled off, but the focus is getting those students ready to be engineers and computer scientists. Enzo, our furry friend, he says the car goes where the eyes go. Yeah, and that's very true. If we start getting digressing on something that's not, not important, all of a sudden that's where we're going. So we keep our eyes on delivery and education and teaching. Jim Collins, a good to great, says if you have the right people on his bus, he calls, to accept responsibility, you don't need to have a lot of senseless rules and mindless bureaucracy. That's kind of the guiding principle concept. We don't even have any senseless rules and mindless bureaucracy on going remote. We have mindless, we have senseless rules and mindless bureaucracy at the university, but we didn't have any for this one. President Nixon. I'm not political on you, but he may, I love this statement. I refuse to make a decision somebody else else can make. The first rule of leadership is save yourself for the big decisions, or AKA your decisions. And I'm gonna tell you, I, I, A, back to Jim Collins' statement, and President Nixon, I, I know we have the right department heads in my college. I know we have the right deans on campus. I've seen this over and over and over again. People taking ownership and then taking responsibility. Also, Jim Collins, life is about balance. Leadership is about balance. We must keep priorities in mind. Early on, the head out of chemical engineering, we're working ourselves to death. Absolutely, 24-7. It was mind-boggling how much we were working just to keep things going. And Dave said, finally, um, folks, if you were at the office, wouldn't you take a break every once in a while and go chat? <laughs> and, and I think everybody said, that's absolutely right. I need mental breaks. And so at that point, I started bringing Maggie, our, our, our Labrador in, and pet her. Ray, you know, Ray, she's not with me right now. For fear she might start barking. Uh, but, you know, or go for a walk for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and so, yes, absolutely, because my friends aren't here at work. And it's just me and Elizabeth and the dog. And so all we were doing was working. And so, man, balance. Also, Jim Collins says, breathe, calm yourself, think, focus, aim, take one shot at a time. We, be, we have to be deliberate. We have to chip away at this monster. And then the last quote, Art of Racing in the Rain Again with, with Enzo. And I grew up on a farm. And then way before I got my driver's license, I was out on muddy dirt roads. And you know, you're, you're, you've lost control. It's, it's, you, stir, you, you steer into the slide. You know, you may end up in the ditch, but, and then you roll back out, but you've main control. And that's what Enzo says. Alas, our driver's not where he had hoped to be, yet he's still in control of his car. He's still able to act in a positive manner. And man, I'm telling you what, we, we haven't made all perfect decisions, but we've tried to retain control. And so I, I just kind of reflected on things that had impression on me, pulled some quotes that I, I love, and man, have we ever validated that in, in shutting down the university, and I suspect we're going to replicate it as we turn it back on. So summarizing, because I think I'm about losing up my allowed time here. I, I don't know. I always loved Dave Gearhart's the U of A. And, and so I'm, we are the U of A. You know, I, I'm an alumnus. Y'all are alum, alumni. We love this place. You know, you squeeze me and I say, Suey Pig. I mean, it's just, it's just me. I love this place. It is part of who I am. <laughs> And it, I, you know, I'm a classic alum. If it wasn't for, I go right down the list of Dwight, Nick, Stan Stevenson, Bill Brown, Neil Schmidt, all my professors. If it hadn't been for them believing in me, I wouldn't have survived electrical engineering. 
And so I love this place. I love Razorback football. I love game day. I love graduation. It's just like, so we are the U of A, right? We are. We make, it's us. You know, it's, it's not the buildings. And don't tell the faculty and staff. It's really not them. It's the students and the alumni that are the U of A. We're the U. We're strong. There's no question. You know, uh, we may not have the endowments of Yale University, you know, and, or Purdue, but, you know, we're strong. We may not have some of the resources that these um, multi-billion dollar endowments can provide. You know, there, there's some pretty extravagant means that are being deployed across the country right now. But we're strong, and we're addressing these things within our means. And you, it, there's no question that we are a strong university with strong leadership, and continue to try to go somewhere during these turbulent times. And we're going to be stronger because of COVID-19, no question about it. John, for one, has learned how to use teleconferencing, right? Man, I, 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 she gave me control. I, I shared my PowerPoint. I didn't even know about this stuff six months ago, four months ago. And I, I just got right in the groove and did it. And then last thing, we're going to continue to make you proud. And that's, that is my promise to you as alumni and that we're gonna to continue to make you proud of this university. So with that, Richard, those are kind of my prepared comments. I'll stop sharing now at this point and uh, certainly entertain any questions you might like to have at this time. Sure, um, I have a couple of questions and then uh, I guess Mary Kate, you're gonna kind of moderate the ones that are posted by others, is that right? Yeah, okay, um, and, and I just wanna, share one side of this is, is I kind of have this this opportunity to live in both worlds which is on the consulting and practice side but also within the university and as things were changing rapidly at the university level uh, they were doing the exact same thing in, in business and um, as the situation deteriorated we realized we were going to have to go all remote and, and like Dean English, um, I was aware of some of these things, but I didn't need that because I just, I wanted to be in front of the students. I want to be in front of my clients and, and colleagues. Um, and I got really stressed about this and I visited with uh, my department head, uh, Micah Hale, who's a great friend. And I said, what are we gonna do? What's the protocol? I need to know what system I'm supposed to use, what decisions I'm supposed to make. Surely there's a checklist on this. And he turned to me and he said, this is the Wild West, man. Uh, as long as you're making decisions that are in the best interest of the students and you consider that, everything will be fine. Don't worry about it. Nobody's going to come to you for violating a policy. We don't even have a policy. Um, and, and it was that support. And I said, well, okay, we're going to try this. And, and I was very open with our students on that and said, I, this is, may not be the best whatever, but we're gonna do what we can on both sides. And, um, and we went from there. And that kind of response is what I put into practice with my colleagues when we shut our office down here. And we went remote working from that standpoint. And um, I, I did talk with my wife about this, who she's also a, a, a former engineer, an undergrad engineer. And I said, I'm, you know, this plays directly into the engineering world. What's the problem? What do we know? What do we not know? Let's try this and see how it works and make an adjustment on it. So um, it's been very fortunate to work within the engineering community and getting these, you know, every other day, getting just a personal update um, on what's going on, what has worked. It's, it's just been greatly beneficial. Um, so how's that going to work when we reopen the campus? I have no idea. But uh, I presume and I'm sure, actually I'm sure that everything's going to be based on the students and uh, the, the wellness of the colleagues and with that in mind, things will, things will move along. We'll be okay. Um, I do have, there, there's a couple of questions that I have and, and one of them uh, to Dean English. I know uh, that one of the biggest roles of a dean is fundraising. I mean, let's not, let's not beat around the bush on it. We got to bring home the bacon. And I had always been taught by my mentors in business was that if you want, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I was going to say the, the how talking, how right, are right. you able to ask for it effectively operate, uh, without or, or actually or coming or and visiting me on this? And then once it's time, they sort of uh, pass it over their shoulder to operations and say, "It's yours now. Please marketing, be, marketing no. it's yours now. I'm on." Hey, show. somebody and needs to go on mute. Florence. Yeah, there you go, Florence. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> so, see, we're all learning. We're all learning. So, uh, as I was saying, you know, um, my colleagues and, and mentors had always taught me, if you're going to make a request to the client or somebody for a donation, financial support to use you as a, as a consultant, whatever, um, but not being able to get Person. How do you say, I want your business, but it's not worth my time to physically come and see you and invest in you? So you travel a lot. How have you been able to do that and maintain that aspect of your job with the fundraising and, and how critical it is, and yet you're, you're tethered to your desk, so to speak? It's a good question, Richard. And, um, you know, in and, and fact, you know, it wasn't long into this, this going remote that's hit my mind. Oh my gosh, we're in the last six months of a capital campaign. Um, we're, we're, we're $8 million short. <laughs> We've got some big ask out there and it absolutely, um, I, I said, Oh gosh, how are we going to handle this one? And, and so, and to add to that, we had just hired a brand new senior director of development and that's likened it to like a department head for me. They're the ones that run our external relations. And so, believe it or not, we were able to use him being new and forced that we couldn't travel. We were able to introduce him to every key donor uh, that we, we were working with. And, you know, though maybe not optimal, everybody was very understanding and that we couldn't get on an airplane and fly to the West Coast, East Coast, Texas, wherever we need to go. And they took those appointments. Um, minus one of the major asks that we have, two hundred million dollar gift from the Walton Family Foundation, and I know that Mark Power and the Chancellor and Laura Jacob worked very hard kicking in their afterburners to work in a remote fashion, and so it's shockingly, I don't think this is the way we want to continue to do it because you know Otto Lohr, who was the dean that made me department head years ago. He had always had to say, got to break bread together, got to break bread together. And, uh, and I do think that says it's important. You know, we go out for a cup of coffee and we talk, or we go out to supper, you know, or you bring us into your home or you come into our home. You know, those things speak volumes. When that's taken off, human nature still desires to see people. Human nature, those who have a heart for giving, they still want to give. And so what, we, what I found is that it, it kept moving right on and we made our goal. The university made their goal. We closed out the campaign. Um, and, you know, in fact, we, the last week, we booked $6 million in gifts, you know, because people wanted to commit to the end of the campaign. And so uh, it, it was, it proved itself to work out just fine. But I suspect once we're released to travel, I'll be back on the road again, Richard. Sure. sure. Well, you know, we, we've talked about it and everybody's experienced this on, on both sides, personal, private, I mean, the simple Zoom meetings with your family. If you set aside the technology aspect of what had to be incorporated to move to the remote operations, remote teaching, and you could go back in, in, in time, aside from technology, is there something that you would, what would you share with your teams, um, like advanced preparations, what do you need to do now so you can continue in this business as usual aspect to the most extent possible. Yeah. You know, I think kind of from a more of a philosophical viewpoint, you know, you, you, in, in our guiding principles, you saw treating people with respect, agility and flexibility. And it somehow could have drilled that into people's minds, students and faculty and staff, you know, it hasn't ever been bad per se, but there have been tense moments, Richard, that, that we've had to plow through. Somehow we could have ingrained and adopted the idea that, you know, respect at all costs, you know, because emotions have run high, you know, and, and every possible vector, you know, students to students, faculty to students, staff to faculty, faculty staff, I mean, every, every direction, it's not been bad, but it sure has been a lesson in those three principles. Um, and, and, you know, if we could have prepared the students, prepared the faculty, prepared the staff, be mentally ready for doing something. I don't know that we could, quite honestly, I would love to say we could have been ready technologically. You know, I, you know it's like, it, 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 this is, had to do it. 
you know, and I'm not sure any of us would have taken the hours a day to learn how to become experts with every possible video conferencing system you can dream of. And then how to record and place that on blackboard and all those clunky things we've got all that to do. But, but I think if we could have done more philosophical, I think from a pedagogy viewpoint, if we could have, the faculty had a moment to think a little bit, you know, we are guilty as most in it. You know, I gave you a PowerPoint presentation today. I hope it was a little interesting, but you know, the death by PowerPoint lecture after lecture after lecture. The only place it's worse is doing it remote. And so we're going into the fall, really encouraging faculty. And Richard, I bet you're thinking about this too, is not per se flipping your class, but putting more problem solving, trying to build those aha moments into your classroom, absolutely insisting on virtual office hours. You know, engineering as as we know is very problem focused. And that's why we drive people nuts typically. And I tell the chancellor and the provost director, don't you put a problem out from your engineering college because we're going to try to solve it. I tell Joe, I say, Joe, we've solved all your problems. I just haven't given you all the solutions because we, you know, we just do it. And, and it's usually we're good. It's not like we're being mean or evil. We're, we're just solving problems. We just, you know, we, 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 we oftentimes are out in front of the university and I'd have to kind of put brakes on and say, hang tight. We need the guiding, guidance from the university first uh, that, so we don't misfire. But, you know, could we have done a better job had we thought about pedagogy geared more towards um, remote synchronous learning? And I say those words very carefully. I think alum need to understand we're not going online. That's not what we're doing. Now, there are some online courses that are approved by the Arkansas Department of Education. Uh, we have four in the entire college of engineering. Everything else is synchronous remote education with a requirement that everything has to be recorded in the event that some student has gone back home down to Southeast Arkansas, has poor wireless and can't stream live. We have to accommodate students who can't stream. But the desire is either you're in class or you're remote, or if you have to, you pick it up on a recording and have thought through that pedagogy. And because I think we've got better ideas on how to do that. We've got tips that's helped us a lot during the course of the summer. Um, but again, I don't know, for, you know, hindsight's always so good. But though, I think those things kind of philosophically get on the same page and then think about pedagogy. And I think the students might have been better served. I think they'll be much better served this fall. I think it'll be a much different success level. So kind of along those lines, um, you know, not just from the students in when they're in school, but um, our what kind of steps, if any, or thoughts are being given to how to incorporate um, remote learning uh, with uh, teaching the students how to function effectively in a remote workspace? Um, not saying that obviously the economy is always going to be remote, but um, several companies, my own included, have now seen uh, some of the benefits and advantages in uh, remote working. Is there going to be any kind of a move within the engineering school to include teaching how to work remotely in there? Or is it just going to be kind of picked up by osmosis from having to do it right now? Or, or what are your thoughts? Um, well, as I was talking to um, Juan Balda last night, Richard, about, you know, because, you know, the, every department's kind of going their way unique to their discipline. You know, I was a doubly undergrad, and so we were pretty lab intensive but we weren't like chemis being wet labs. We're 100% dry labs. Oscilloscope, breadboard, resistors, capacitors, and some transistors, you know, we can, we can break apart circuits and analyze them. Well, you know, so this, so and, and just imagine in a typical electrical engineering lab, you have a, literally a bucket or a bin of resistors, and every hand goes into that thing all the time, and all of a sudden, all the, you're thinking coronavirus. Ugh. You know, I don't stick my hand in behind everybody else, and I can't wash all those resistors. And so they start talking about, well, this is what we find. They have found kits for under 200 bucks, okay? And, and they can, right now are handling all labs except electromagnetics, fields and waves, and the capstone design. And, and honestly, the software that comes with these kits, basically it's an eight analog to digital converter that you can pick up an analog circuit and take current readings, capacitance, induction, voltage, and those are what's called analog. 
And so you convert that to a digital signal and you plug it into your computer and it integrates with some software and it is more functional than a multi-thousand dollar oscilloscope. It can do transformations. It's called like a Fourier transform, and, and that, not to go into that, but it, it's kind of likened to music. You know, and, and believe it or not, engineers have a great appreciation of how music works because you can take a signal and break it down into the frequency domain or think about chord structure, what creates harmony and lack of harmony. You're, you're in phase in that signal. And so the oscilloscope reads a signal, and many times to analyze it, we need to do a Fourier transform. You can't do that on oscilloscope, but you can on your computer with this software. So I think things like that, um, do, I kind of think students will have learned, do they have to get face-to-face -face every design team meeting? You know, can, can they do this remote? And can you, you know, hey, let's, let's get Professor So-and-so in here. Maybe, maybe they're available at 3.30 today. Through professor so-and-so could never make a 3.30 meeting, but you can plug him in for five minutes to get their guidance on something. I, I think maybe that's more, I, I don't know that we'll, we'll deliberately go after a remote because engineering is still such a hands-on. I mean, chemical engineering is going to have to have wet experiments. There is no question about it. And they're even taking some classrooms and, and those that don't require thumb hoods and they're, they're spreading out the students in a classroom and setting up with their experiments. Social distancing, wearing face masks on their own workstation, but taking what would have helped maybe 60 people and they cut it down to 15 people. And so I think we've learned things like that, how we maybe can better serve more students in a higher effective way. Um, and, um, and then also, you know, using more simulation. But, you know, we'll never drive engineering, as you know, Richard, to completely online. You know, you won't see the University of Phoenix at Al rolling out engineering disciplines that you would probably want to hire them in your firm. You yeah, know, absolutely. You, 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 you need to go to a structures lab to be a civil engineer, you know. You, you, you need to break things, you know. <laughs> and absolutely. And those loads and understand when you put a real beam up there what where the forces are. You've got to have seen that. Well, that's what drove me into civil, the ability to break things. So. <laughs> Um, you know, so career-wise or, or work-wise, we always have our own personal goals, professional goals, and things that we derive enjoyment from. What have you found rewarding during this time of remote work? I mean, there's a positive from every situation. I'm curious what, what you've taken from this now that the, the shock of going into this has kind of worn off and we've dealt with it. You know, that, that's a really good question. And this one kind of gets a little bit emotional. And so I'll, those who know me, I'm a crier. I can get emotional, which is also not very engineering-like. I don't know where this came from. But um, I tell you, the, the team of department heads and associate deans, I think we're like this now. I and mean, we are wrapped around it. And we have conversations that in 13, Team going on 14 years of being dean, oh, my gosh, all the way from inclusion, inclusivity questions, equity adjustments, pedagogy and teaching. Oh man, we like what Double E's doing. Can we copy that? Of course you can copy that. It's like turf is, I've never been one to promote turf. I hate turf. You know, I've never worked with deans that fought for resources. We always, I've always been blessed by working with deans who like to share resources. It was true at K-State too. Really true here at Arkansas. So I would say some of the most wonderful moments have been working with my direct reports or our direct reports to the dean, they're not mine. <laughs> they're the department heads and the associate deans. And then working with my colleagues. I mean, I, I adore these people. And you know, uh, Donnie Smith said something once, he was past CEO of Tyson. And uh, he and I was in the same church. I was in a Sunday school class when we first moved back to Arkansas back in 91. And Donnie very boldly uses the word love around the workplace. And he says, you know, John, I was interviewing him once on a, on a podcast, and me and John White. And uh, he says, you know, if I love these people, and I do, then we're going we're gonna to talk about things. 
when there's performance improvement, we're not going to dodge that bullet. We're going to talk about it. You do something really good, we're going to talk about it. And I've kind of gone down that path, Richard. Really recognizing, okay, burn it up here, John. Um, really realizing these people are more than department heads, associate deans, staff, and, and deans. They really are in my hula hoop of friendship. And that has been probably the most wonderful thing during all this. We're, we're emotional, you can tell I'm emotionally kind of worn out, you know. But God is good, He'll supply my needs. I'm just say that boldly. I, uh, we got to go to a somewhat of a humorous question since okay. say, uh, I just made the Dean of Engineering of the University of Arkansas tear up. So we got to <laughs> change that. Um, so a question, um, we, we face this at my office. We are not remote working at this moment. We're blessed with a lot of space where we can spread out and we are following all of the social distancing. One of the first things we noticed though, after our staff had been gone and working remotely was everybody got into their own coffee brew at home. And uh, suddenly you come back to the office and there's the standard office coffee that's there. And uh, you've been doing for weeks making your own brew. How are you gonna handle that in the College of Engineering with the office coffee? Are we talking about allocating of funds to Keurigs and K-Cups? I mean, this is the real deal. Everybody knows engineers run off of coffee. So, so what's gonna happen? Well, you know, being the engineering college we are, we have a, we do in our, in our uh, return to campus plan, we have a procedure to follow. You have to clean the coffee pot first of all when you use it. Okay, we, 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 we call that one out in our plan. And uh, gosh, I hate to tell you, Richard, but when I came as dean, I'd already kind of gotten ex been exposed to my kind of coffee. I went out and we bought a new Keurig already. So, so now the discussion is going to be how much variety, because right now you can get like uh, breakfast blend, Pike's Place, and French Roast. I'm betting we're going to have to invest in greater variety. We may have to go from, from you know, maybe Pete's to, you know, I don't know. And so we, just, we may just unload some big money, you know, 10 or $20 more a month. Well, I think, I think you need to involve the industrial folks on the operations of how we're going to do this. And statistically, I mean, you open up the condiments, the creams, the sugars, <laughs> business here. So, um, I mean, that's the only way we're going to be successful if the coffee is, is, is right. Uh, Absolutely. The good life, we can't go backwards. So, but, Now, what about wearing shorts to work? Are you allowing that? Because I hate to tell you that if I were to stand up, I would, you would find out that I have my shirt tail out and I'm wearing <laughs> shorts and I'm wearing these really comfortable shoes. So can we accommodate those things, you think? I, you know, at our, our office, we have not, we, we have done a couple days in the summer before where we're well wear shorts, but uh, I, I personally, uh, on, on short day, I, I wore pants and my wife chastised me for it. And I said, I, I just can't do it. I just can't not wear pants to work. Um, I, I don't know, maybe, um, but if we do, I'm going to need some heads up because we, we need some criteria. Are we talking cargo shorts? <laughs> Um, you know, we got to be on the same page here. And is there a minimum tan requirement? Because again, engineers, it could be blinding. So it, it, yeah, and then make cat, your legs might catch on fire. <laughs> right, right. We don't want to injure the students and harm them when they've just come back. Uh, so we got to think about these things. Absolutely. <laughs> but um, Mary Kate, are there are there questions that have come in, or I mean, because I could pepper Dean English with questions all day. Um, we do have a few. If, um, I, Dean English, I'll read you some of the questions we've gotten. Okay. Uh, this one is from Chuck Tillman. He said, "How do you think that online learning this semester will impact future plans?" So you addressed that a little bit. Um, do you think you'll see more and more blended learning going forward from here on out? You know what I think it'll be a, a, a new boldness and Chuck that's a really good question I like, mean Chuck it was was my student years ago and he's done very very well my biggest challenge with Chuck was staying ahead of him intellectually he was so, he's so smart and so when Chuck asked me a question it's gonna be a hard one probably um, but you know you know we talk about you know before COVID-19 Faculty, some were experimenting with things like flipped classrooms. 
Um, and to limited success. But I have to wonder if faculty have discovered that somehow learning is, is, is improved when you kind of get out of the formality of a lecture and start working on real problems. And, you know, I, I can remember way back in my career, probably Chuck was in my, yeah, I know Chuck was in my ISTAT course, and, and we'd collect data on the fly off of a little handmade uh, catapult. And, and I can tell, I can affirm you some of the best moments in class is when I got a data set I didn't know what to do with. You know, it was just, I was working behind the scenes trying to figure out. So I think, and, and I wasn't smart enough to realize maybe some real learning was going on going on when the students are down on the floor collecting their own data and fitting models. So I have to believe, Chuck, that perhaps we've learned how perhaps we can, in fact, uh, strategically flip material where the lecture needs to be watched, you know, to learn maybe the theory, the, 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 the formal aspects of the body of knowledge, but maybe on the practical side, we'll, we'll learn how to do, make better use of the classroom. Like I was telling Rich, we're never gonna eliminate the need for hands-on combat, basically, for engineering and science students. You have to go into the labs and you have to conduct experiments. But maybe we can get more active learning in our classrooms because of what we've learned, because we all, we're all very comfortable now with, with video conferencing. I think, and I, and I can mention also, I do think students, I hope, are gonna learn that they can use this. You know, uh, you know, and quite honestly, I prefer to see a face now I learn than a phone call. You know, in fact, it's kind of a drag to get a phone call. You know, I like to see faces and get your reactions like Mary Kay, I'm seeing you smile. It makes me feel good, you know. And whereas if it was just a phone call. I would. Am I saying the right things? You know, that was a good question, Chuck. He had kind of a follow-up to that too. Chuck said, uh, how have admissions this year compared versus other regional universities? So how do you think this will impact future graduates and their connection as alumni? Yeah, you know, that, that worries me. You know, um, being remote doesn't accomplish everything we do as a modern university. That's why it's worth the experiment of bringing students back. You know, if it, it's, we're, we're a living environment. You know, I have a really close friendship with all the deans across the state. We, we talk every other, we've been doing meeting every other week, you know, um, Henderson to A State to UA Fort Smith to ULR. And, and our mission is, is a lot different. And, you know, what, you know, the, the good, the land grant experience isn't just becoming a, civil engineer like Richard or industrial engineer like Chuck, you know, it's, it's the experience. It, I know for Chuck and I, we were way more than uh, advisor student. We, we were friends and I learned from him and hopefully he learned a little bit from me. Um, and, um, and, and that coupled with extracurricular activities like the student activities, crazy softball games and eating hot dogs, you know, that whole experience has got to come back, you know, or I do, it does concern me on, you know, from the heart viewpoint, what the connection is. And so, uh, and, and, and furthermore, we, we need to turn this university back on and, uh, and, and get the community up and running again. And uh, we'll do what's right and what's safe, but uh, Chuck's hitting it right on the head. Yeah. yeah. Well, before we wrap it up, we have a couple that aren't questions, but they're comments for you. So uh, one is from Regina Hopper. She's one of our board members as well. She said, this is one of the most emphatic presentations we have seen. Thank you for reminding us that we're all human with emotions and fears. Yeah. Engineering is about solving issues and you gave us a reminder of one of the most important components of our ability, our collective ability to beat this. So. That's Thank one for you. And then we have one from Emily Money who said, um, <laughs> one upside to remote learning is that my first grader was able to participate in the virtual heroes engineering camp this summer and that she loved it. The engineering students did a great job in the with the instructional videos and facilitating the online sessions. So definitely still making an impact. Thank you, Emily. That's very sweet. Yeah. <laughs> good. That's good reminders, aren't they? Yes. 
<laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I wanna thank Richard very much and Dean English. Thank you Absolutely. both for joining us. We are very lucky to get to hear from both of you today. 